So welcome everybody in Iceland. I wish I would be there. So when uh, my family heard that I uh, would uh, participate at the conference in Iceland, everybody said, oh, let's go there and do holidays. But uh, unfortunately, I have not enough time this time, but I hopefully uh, another time. Uh, I would like to, uh, let's see. I would like to uh, say something about three slopes and avalanches, as it was in the, the program. And uh, the concept of my presentation is that I uh, would like to first to talk a little bit about forest dynamics and avalanche forest interactions in the Swiss Alps. Uh, then what we can learn about uh, from high altitude deforestation in the Alps, where we have uh, many decades of experience and uh, then I would uh, like to come with the last slide uh, uh, to back to I Iceland and uh, ask myself what we can learn maybe from there or how the situation is there. Uh, in the Alps, we have uh, uh, increasing forest cover since uh, 1850 about. You see here uh, two pictures from uh, my hometown the Vos, where uh, I grew up and where I still work and live. So uh, on the left, the Vos in the year 1900, and uh, on the right, a current picture. And uh, when I... Oh. When I add uh, pictures from uh, inside of the forest, then we, we see it was a, a grazed forest before. It is very typical. 100 years ago, and now we have there, where we had a lot of grazing, a lot of management, we have dense, even age forest, usually spruce forests with a, a low resilience and a high susceptibility to disturbances. So these are quite major problems we face now in, in uh, forest management in, in Switzerland. Here are a picture from uh, Andermatt in uh, the central Swiss Alps, also from uh, the 19th century, where we had much uh, uh, a, a smaller area of forest, but it, it is a really important forest here because it protects the village of Andermatt from avalanches, as you see. So when you have forests in the release area or in part of the release area, then that's very valuable. On the right side, uh, you see that this forest has also been, the forest cover has increased also partly by the help of uh, avalanche constructions above the uh, forest, so above the tree line where it's, it's uh, not possible to plant trees. Uh, usually people help with uh, avalanche constructions. Uh, you see in the central part of the forest, there uh, is an opening. This uh, was a, a disturbance by wind throw. So disturbances, natural disturbances have, uh, yeah, are increasing. The, the denser the forests are becoming, uh, the, the more disturbances we had in the few, uh, in the past, in the last decades. And with climate change, we even expect now more and, and larger natural disturbances, especially by bark beetles and also by fire. So we have uh, these situations here, which are uh, yeah, a concern, also in terms of uh, uh, protection against natural hazards, a village uh, with a protection forest above it, uh, which has been uh, destroyed first by wind throw and afterwards uh, follow up disturbances by bark beetle disturbances. Now, uh, avalanches, we have, you, you know that we have basically two effects. First in the release area, uh, forest prevents from avalanche releases and uh, when the avalanche release is released high above the tree line, we as a rule of thumb, we say more than 150 or 200 meters above the tree line, then actually the, the uh, forest cannot resist enough. So we have landscape changes. We have these avalanche tracks, uh, which are, uh, are uh, valuable from a landscape uh, point of view, but uh, they are also sign of uh, tree disturbances. Thermally. I think, yeah, when we go into detail, so influence in the release area, uh, we have several in influences. 
what is very obvious is that, that the snow depth is uh, lower usually in the forest stand, and we have a, a more disturbed uh, snow uh, cover, so we have less of, of uh, these hom homogeneous layers where uh, avalanches may be triggered. Just a, a picture here, a, a snow profile outside of the forest and on the edge of the forest and inside of the forest. Then uh, when the avalanche is released high above, I have a video here. So uh, this is what this is happening. Uh, this is a, a, a picture from just where I grew up, from, the, from this house. And uh, fortunately, nothing happened, so, but, but it looks quite scary here from this. So when the avalanche are released from high above, tree line, we actually also uh, simulated this model with, with the RAM software, and you can quite uh, uh, well simulate the, the runoff zone and also the tree destruction. So this is quite uh, uh, state of the art that we, we can model these avalanches. Oh, it's, I've, we've seen this again. <laughs> So, I, I, as, as a next point, I would like to talk a, a bit about uh, afforestation. Uh, and uh, I have one example where, where we uh, did, or, or also my, the, my, the, the people who worked before me uh, here at our institute, uh, did a, a lot of uh, experiments. And the, the largest experiment was at the uh, Stilberg site. It's a site which looked uh, 50 years ago like this. So it's a typical avalanche release area above the tree line. We have uh, on the right side some uh, temporary wooden avalanche barriers. In one part of the experiment, the rest is without these. And there were many, uh, many avalanches came every year actually on, on this slope. And then in 1975, the whole slope, so from uh, the tree line until high above the tree line was planted with uh, with trees, with three different uh, tree species. So one color dot is just is 25 uh, trees of one species. It was the most promising species uh, based on uh, first trials in, in these areas with stone pine, mountain pine, and European larch. And they were planted here in a regular pattern. So what is white is just a, a climate station and a trail and so, some rocks here. And uh, I, I just walked through this experiment uh, through the last 50 years. So after 10 years, uh, we, we, we saw a, a quite an interesting survival pattern. So in, in the lower part, the, the, the trees survived. In the upper part, not so many trees survived. All three species did, did uh, quite well, but it, it was a different uh, mainly the altitude, but we saw also that, that the micro size mattered. So, so some micro size, uh, all the, the trees died, other micro size, uh, the trees survived very well. So micro size uh, mattered a lot and temperature. Then after 20 years, the pattern looked like this. So Larix decidua, the, the European large turned out to be on this side, the, the best surviving trees, also in the higher uh, elevations. The other three species had uh, problems. Our main cause of that was uh, snow fungi. So where the, the snow cover was lying long uh, until May or so, then the, the trees has had quite uh, low survival probabilities. And this uh, it was, was quite a, a bottleneck stage, this, this age. After 30 years, we had uh, additional or other uh, drivers or, or problems, so mechanical damages, the tree were uh, a bit higher, and the frost events were more important. So late frost events uh, um, yeah, were um, um, quite a, a major mortality factor in this, in this uh, stage. And uh, we see now that, that the Larix was not, uh, not only in the highest side, also in the lowest side, the, the best surviving species here. And now the, the pattern looks uh, like this. So we have uh, still about uh, almost 30% surviving, on, almost only the larix. The trees are getting higher, 
especially in the, the lower part, uh, and they start to uh, have com competence, competition. So it's a it's a, quite a change of the drivers of the most important mortality and growth factors within these last 45 years. When you look again at this uh, site, you see that the tree line it is uh, about 2,100 meters here, uh, but we see that the uh, visa for states, it was possible to uh, grow tree or plant trees in an avalanche release area also, also higher up. The right side, you see this, this larches at the top, and they were growing in the last 15 years, and this, this was also a, a partly a, a cause of, of a climate change. They were growing even more in the higher part than in the lower part where uh, there was more competition. So some lessons learned from this uh, site and also from other afforestations uh, in the Swiss Alps. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's important to uh, plant trees not everywhere. So this was a, this Stilberg afforestation was a, a scientific experiment. So it was, uh, so tree was, one tree was planted after the other in a systematic pattern. But in nature, we, uh, or also as a learning from this, it's better to study first the environment, look at the slope from the other side, see where is the snow lying long. For example, when, when we're in June, there is still snow, it's not, not really promising. Uh, and, and study the microsite conditions. Today with thermal cameras, it, very easy, so you have high contrast on, on small areas of the microsite. Also, respect soil my, uh, uh, so, uh, soil properties, natural hazards from above, of course. So when, when there are natural hazards coming from above, then it's uh, it makes not much sense to to plant trees there. Uh, then important. Uh, it's, it's important to aim for, for uh, heterogeneity, also in a, already in an early stage. So what we recommend is, is usually to start planting on the, on the most promising sites. So on, on this, uh, in this environment, which we have here, it was more on the, the richest and then on the uh, sunniest, sunnier sites and uh, plant the trees in, in clusters so that uh, they can, the trees can help each other, but don't compete each other too much, and with the time when we have a certain forest climate, it's uh, possible to grow other uh, trees in in the gap. So we have uh, we have often the uh, situation that, uh, for example, in our situation, Larix uh, was growing well, and uh, but in the protection of the Larix, other species like spruce or uh, other um, uh, evergreen species could grow well and were less damaged by, by frost, by late frost. Uh, and uh, it's important, it, it is different like in this picture here, important to evaluate and use different tree species as much as possible. Yeah. Also, we had uh, in the past in Switzerland, we had a lot of problems with uh, too dense afforestation. So uh, after 50 or 60, 70 years, they look often like this, so are, are often very susceptible to disturbances in, in later stage. These are pictures I, I also saw uh, recently in, in, in Norway, where we did some visits in, in uh, afforestations, and uh, I saw there the uh, very similar problems now with these old uh, thick spruce afforestations like we had uh, uh, in, the, in the past. And what, what we try here is uh, to do management interventions. If, if we did, did not do this uh, cluster afforestation pattern, then uh, it's, it's necessary to do some interventions in early stages. So as long as the crowns are uh, not short, as long as the crowns are green, uh, so that we have some uh, heterogeneity in the, in the, in the, in the pattern. Uh, also, uh, a lesson learned from the past in Switzerland, I mean, avalanche protection forests or afforestation for avalanche protection forests are often very, very valuable. So uh, 
I think we many villages could not be uh, um, enlarged or, or many valleys w would uh, it would not be possible to, to live in some valleys in Switzerland without this afforestation. But uh, also sometimes we have afforestations where there is not mu there was not much to protect and other uh, where we have ve very valuable uh, pastures before. Uh, like in, in, in this case, we have here also a, a very dense afforestation on a site which would, uh, without forest, uh, very valuable from a biodiversity point of view, or the, from different other, so f or from uh, habitat point of view. And uh, I certainly for for uh, for uh, when you when you look at the climate or when when you look at the carbon balance, then it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's also very positive and valuable. Uh, we made also an analysis, uh, a long, uh, long term analysis about the effect of the uh, of trees in snow rich areas on the albedo. And there we saw that, uh, yeah, at least a part of this gain on the climate forcing uh, was offset by the albedo effect that uh, a dark uh, green forest uh, has a lower albedo than the, the white snow cover. But that's just as a, as a side note. No avalanche protection forest in, in Iceland. So uh, I, I was never in Iceland, So, but this is something we, we certainly should discuss afterwards. Uh, generally, I, th I think it, uh, or what, what I have seen from, from uh, the, the pictures which I have seen so far from, from Iceland, I, I think uh, where we have the, the very, the release area of the very big avalanches, uh, like on the, this picture of above, uh, I think it's a, a, a very limited potential to, to uh, grow their trees, at, le at least at the current uh, climate, uh, because uh, I, I don't think that it would, will be easy to, to grow trees here. But you, you know better. You can uh, uh, tell me how the situation is. But, but I think in a, in a case like the, in the, the lower picture, uh, this is this. Uh, Olafur has, has sent me this picture. So I, I, I think here it's, it, uh, it's quite a, a potential to grow trees high when, when the trees are growing here uh, behind the, the house. I don't think that this helps a lot uh, for, for, the, for the protection against avalanches because if, if the avalanche comes from above, then it, it may be destroyed. But uh, if you are able to grow these trees here, then it should also be, we should also be able to grow them a little bit higher with the adequate Afforestation techniques and, the, and the, the best possible tree species. But also here, you 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 may know know this area better and could judge. So I, I think there is a considerable potential to protect from uh, smaller avalanches, some important avalanches. Probably there is in future an increasing potential to do that. I think. Uh, what is Im important in my point of view is that uh, if you if you are doing more afforestation in, in Iceland uh, in order to protect from natural hazards, avoid the same mistakes we did sometimes in the past. I think there we can learn not not everything, but we have some learnings from uh, from the, from the Alps, and uh, I would be very happy to to collaborate on that and and uh, exchange and see. Uh, what is different in Iceland than in the Alps, and and uh, yeah, what 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 we can learn from each other actually. So I think this was my last slide. It's uh, we see here on the this slide also an, an uh, a typical situation in the Alps where we have uh, forest and then uh, avalanche uh, path, so avalanche tracks, and then we have some uh, avalanche barriers on the on the right side and where we have not the avalanche barriers or below we have avalanche releases uh, which uh, would destroy the forest below 
And we see also areas where we have this protection effect of the trees against avalanches. With that picture, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to discuss with you and take your, your questions. Thanks. I, I guess you can hear us, Peter. I hear you. Yeah, good. Uh, we'll open the, open the floor for questions now. Any questions for, for Peter? Yep, Brynjólfur. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you mentioned uh, three species that you mostly used in your trials. Uh, one of it was uh, Pinus sembra. And yes, Pinus sembra. And it was not so successful. But as I know, it is growing higher than large forests usually. How come it was not so successful? And you also mentioned the mistakes you have uh, done in, in, in Switzerland or in the Alp region. What mistakes was, did you do in, in, in the past? Yes, I, uh, I understood the first part of the question, the last part. I, I start with the with the Swiss stone pine, so with the uh, pine of Zebra. Uh, so this was in this area, it was not so successful, uh, mainly because they were affected by snow fungi, and the, the main reason why it was not successful was because it was not only planted where this Swiss stone pine uh, grows originally or with wherever it's the favorite site. So this is mainly the, on the ridges. The Swiss stone pine is uh, distributed by the, the nutcracker, so by a bird. And the bird uh, hides the seeds of this stone pine mainly on, 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 uh, on ridges, where the bird can find them again in the winter. And this is the natural habitat. And in afforestation, people neglected that and uh, planted them all over the place. And the effect was, that uh, on, on the areas where, uh, on, on the, in the gullies, when they were planted in the gullies, they were affected by snow fungi, and these snow fungi were spreading also to better sites. So it was, uh, I think it was, if the stone pine would have planted only there, where also in nature it grows favorably, then uh, I think it would be much more successful. So I'm, I'm not sure if see stone pine is a species which it would be an option also for, for Iceland. It's very, very uh, frost resistant. It has many advantages, right? Yes, we plant it here. Okay, and it <laughs> yeah. comes well? Oh yes, very well. Yeah. Uh, Samson has a question. Samson Harderson. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure if I responded to the, the second part of the question. I, ah, okay. Uh, or yeah, but yeah, I, no, go ahead. He, he'll wait. Yeah. Ah, yes. Uh, the question is just about to come. Just a, just a second. Yes, my question is about uh, how successful it is to use more like shrub species, like krumholz, like uh, the shrubby alnus and the shrubby pinus. Pinus muco, and, uh, is that successful against avalanches? Yeah. I, I could acoustically not very well hear. Can you, can you maybe repeat? Yes, the, 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 can you? Yeah, the, question, the question was about uh, using shrubs rather than right. tall trees, like, uh, like uh, Alnus and maybe Pinus muco, how, yeah. how successful or, or unsuccessful they might be in avalanche protection? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So, so and there's a lot of discussion about, about that. So when there is a very a lot of snow, so two meters of snow or so, then uh, they are laying down and uh, we have sometimes even more avalanches uh, where we have these shrubs. They, they don't help so much. 
when, when there is a less known, when there is only uh, like a, for small avalanches, when there is only one meter of snow, then, then they help, then they provide some more roughness. But uh, in extreme events, usually they, they are lying down, and the, the roughness uh, is uh, it's not, uh, not important anymore. So we have a, a lot of avalanches coming from uh, these dwarf drop areas. Which or, or if, so I, I could also uh, show you pictures from from there where it's, uh, it looks in the in the summer quite quite well, and uh, in the winter when there is a lot of snow, then the the, the, the shrubs are just lying on the, on the the floor. Yeah. Yes. One more question, Oder. But sometimes maybe to to add that. When you have a bit, bit higher, it, it depends on the, on the height of the shrubs. But when you have something like a sorbus or, or other higher, uh, then it's also possible that uh, it's a start of a good protection for it. So in, in, the, in, the, in the protection of these shrubs, it's possible to grow other tree species. And that, that may also help. Hello. <laughs> Okay, hi, hi. Um, I was supposed to come up here and ask the question directly to you. Um, I, I recently changed the field from uh, avalanche science into forestry, so I think you're, uh, uh, it was uh, very interesting, uh, your speak. Uh, I saw the picture of, uh, uh, of, the, of the summer house, and I think I recognized the picture, and it's by a farm that is uh, quite... Uh, uh, is most frequently uh, uh, has a most frequent uh, is their farmhouse that has most frequent uh, avalanches hitting the farm in Iceland, uh, named Garðar, and I think it's in uh, it's in Reyniskverfi, and uh, in the area I totally agree with you. I think uh, the trees should grow higher. We, the forest would grow there. And uh, as a avalanche uh, prevention, it would be largely effective. I totally agree with you there. And in areas where we have a, a short slope with uh, avalanche dangers, like uh, uh, drownsness, like uh, weak, it would be really uh, profitable to have forest in the area. Um, <clears throat> but uh, my, uh, I quite often get the, uh, no, the questions about roots affecting avalanches. Uh, do you have any comments of, uh, of, uh, of uh, species regarding to what kind of root system they have? Root systems, yeah. Um, root system is, for avalanches, it's not uh, so crucial as it is for... Uh, landslide protection or also rockfall protection. So uh, usually we say when, when you have a deep root system, it's, it's better as a protection, especially for against uh, landslide, debris flows, rockfall. Uh, for avalanches, we also see that uh, yes, spruce forests with quite a shallow root system uh, helps a lot, but um, even there, so, uh, a, a, a deep root system is, is, uh, is usually better, but the, the, the other um, components of the, of the protection effect, so this, the, the whole interception of a, of a tree, uh, the, uh, so interception of snow, so if it's an uh, evergreen species, that is, that is a very important, uh, uh, yeah, a component, it's more valuable than, than uh, for example, a large. So I think this is more important than the, the root system. Okay, we have uh, one more question from Alastair Sigurdsson. Well, it's actually not a question, it's rather a clarification, that lower photo showing the avalanche stopping in a forest. Those trees were planted by myself Okay. back in the 1980s. Uh, okay. That summer, that summer cabin is owned by my uh, extended family, and 
that avalanche actually stopped at the forest, didn't go any further. But it was a very shallow type of yeah. avalanche. Yeah. But I have had that idea for many decades. It would be yeah. good to plant up the hill to where the source of those avalanches are, but I never was able to make any agreement with the landowners to take land out of sheep grazing uh, for that purpose. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, Congratulations to the to the house. It's, it's very. And it was not a, a criticism. So I I, I uh, think the the trees behind the house uh, in in this case because um, the Average release area is quite uh, close, so it, it really can maybe support. So probably the average which come there have low speed, and uh, it may still help to decelerate. And, and maybe in a, if you're lucky, you, it, it can help in one case or, or another. And uh, yeah, I hope you can make an agreement with the, <laughs> with the neighbors one time. <laughs> I I think the I think the the it has clearly been stated here that uh, that for most of our big avalanches that uh, that uh, originate high in the mountains, planting trees close to them at the, in the source area is is not a, an option for us. But for smaller avalanches, uh, smaller avalanches in smaller areas, lower on the slopes, it is a it is a possibility. But um, probably a narrow band of trees just above the houses will just make things worse because the snow, the uh, avalanche will take the trees with it. Yeah. Um, I, I guess is a problem. So narrow bands of trees are not necessarily the best is, is the message I'm getting. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, we have time for one more question. If anyone. Yes, okay, we have one more. Bjarde, you have to run up here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to make it, uh, have some fun. Uh, no, I think also I, I agree with, with Thruster. We have been very interested in the forest tree sector in Iceland. Uh, if we should introduce more protective uh, afforestation. Uh, we have not really, be, really been planting trees uh, for avalanche protection. And, for example, this rule of thumb that you said, that if the source area was more higher up than 150 meters above mm -hmm. the plantations, that is like the limit where the trees will stand and stop the avalanche. I think this simple things like this is actually a very important message you are telling us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something we, we learned from past events, but also from modeling. Uh, when you have a, a shorter distance, but this is also uh, when I refer again to the, the, pic, the, the last picture, when we are between uh, zero and 150 meters, then it's something that uh, the forest may have some limited effect, but yeah, you really don't really can count on this. So, so I, I think the, the rules of thumb is, is useful. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. I w it was just pointed out that that you didn't actually answer the first question that you got about what specific what specific mistakes that you have made can you warn us about? Yeah. Yeah. I I think the the main mistake is to uh, plant uh, two dense avalanches just with neglecting uh, the nature, just with ne neglecting the microsite, just plant trees all over the place and then not watch them. Just uh, let them grow and after 30, 40, 50 years, you have all the, the problems and uh, often not very successful uh, plantation. So it, it's, uh, I think it's important to study the, the site, study the nature, uh, think about the, the different species Try to bring heterogeneity in the in the in the stand. So not only, if possible, not only one species because it's a higher risk. 
it's, it's the last week, so you have maybe two or three speeches. Um, yeah, this is the, probably the most important message. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for being with us today. We'll, we'll say goodbye for now, and please give him a good round of applause. Thank you very much.